Shalom and welcome to the Hebraic Heritage Ministries Yeshiva Discipleship Program. This is part eight of the series, Two Houses and the New Testament. In this series, we've been explaining that Yeshua being the Messiah, that his primary role in his earthly ministry and then his second coming is to gather the exiles of Israel. In this session, we are going to look at Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9 and also Peter's vision in Acts chapter 10 and see how these two events is related and associated with the understanding of how the exiles of Israel are to be gathered. In his earthly ministry, Yeshua had 12 disciples who were sent out in the nations to fish for the exiles of Israel. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit as we see in Acts chapter 2 to accomplish this task. In John chapter 11 verses 49 through 52, we can see here how we're told that Yeshua died on the tree to gather the exiles of Israel, as it is written. And one of them, named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Yeshua should die for that nation. The next verse says, and not for that nation only. So Yeshua is dying for two different nations. Who are these two nations and how are they described? Continuing in the verse, it says that he should gather together in one, that is these two nations, who are the children of God scattered abroad. Who are these two nations that are the children of God scattered abroad? It is northern kingdom and southern kingdom. Yeshua died on the tree to pay for the penalty of the sins of both northern kingdom and southern southern kingdom and by them receiving his redemptive work when he died on the tree and shed his blood for the forgiveness of their sins if they would repent he would offer unto them redemption and in doing so Yeshua would be offering redemption to the entire world. Yeshua sent out fishermen to gather the exiles of Israel. This is the reason why he called his disciples and this was ultimately what he was training and preparing them to do. Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 and 19 it is written, in Yeshua Walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The Hebrew word for man is Adam. And this is a term that is associated and connected to the nation of Israel as we can see in Ezekiel chapter 34 verse 31 and Ezekiel in chapter 36 verse 10. In Jeremiah chapter 16 verses 14 through 16 is where we find that fishers would be sent out to the exiles of Israel as it is written. Therefore behold the days come says the Lord, that it will no more be said, the Lord lives that brought up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, but 
the Lord lives that brought the children of Israel from all the lands where he has driven them, and I will bring them again to their own land. Jeremiah 16, 16 tells us how this was to be done. Behold, I will send for many fishers, says the Lord, and they will fish for them. You know, when you go fishing, sometimes you catch fish, sometimes you don't. And so in going out to the exiles of Israel, they were going to be those who would receive the message and those who would not. Mark chapter 1, verse 17, Yeshua commissioned his disciples with these words, Come after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men, or specifically the exiles of Israel. In Genesis in chapter 48, verse 16, in the blessing that is bestowed upon Ephraim and Manasseh, it is said of them that they would grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth, as it is written. The angel, which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them in the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac. And the King James says, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. This word grow is the Strong's number 1711. It's the Hebrew word dega, which means fish. It is translated here to increase, to grow, or to multiply. We can see where the same Hebrew word dega is translated as fish in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, as it is written. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Therefore, Ephraim and his blessing of multiplication is likened unto fish. That is why Yeshua said to his disciples that if you follow me, I'm going to make you a fisher of men. That is Ephraim scattered into the nations when they got exiled for their disobedience and keeping the commandments that were given at Mount Sinai. In Acts chapter 1, we have an account where Yeshua, following his resurrection, is seen 40 days and he's given a 40-day sermon, and his subject is the kingdom of God, as it is written in Acts chapter 1, verse 3, to whom also he, that is Yeshua, showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. We are not told the details of what he taught these 40 days, we have only recorded for us one question that got asked. So of everything that he said, which is extremely important, especially after his resurrection, all that we have is one question. That one question is recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 6, which says, When they were therefore come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What is the restoration of the kingdom to Israel? It is the gathering of the exiles of Israel from all the lands where they've been scattered. So obviously Yeshua was teaching on this subject because he was asked, are you going to do it at this time? Then Yeshua explains the process of how this was going to happen. The answer is found in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, which reads, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. That's the answer to the question of, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? He says, you are going to be empowered, and you will be my witness of what? Empowered to be a witness of the restoration of the kingdom to Israel. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, 
Judea and Samaria, which is the West Bank today, and the uttermost parts of the earth. That is because the exiles of Israel were scattered to the uttermost parts of the earth. So this message has to be proclaimed to them where they've been scattered, which means the entire world. With that in mind, let's look at Acts chapter 9 and what we're told about the conversion of Paul and see how this is related to the commissioning of believers in Yeshua as the Messiah to go out in the nations and proclaim Messiah, repentance of sins, and the ingathering of the exiles. In Acts chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, we are told how before Paul became a believer in Yeshua, that he persecuted believers in Yeshua, as it is written. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, that is a believer in Yeshua, whether they were men or women, he would bring them bound unto Jerusalem, that is to the Jewish religious authorities. Yeshua appears to Paul. Acts chapter 9, verses 3 and 4 is written. And as he journeyed, he came to Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? You notice when the believers in Yeshua are persecuted, it's the same as persecuting Yeshua himself. Yeshua then responds to Paul this way, in Acts chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, as it is written. And he said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Yeshua, whom you persecute. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. In other words, it's going to be hard for you to not obey and follow what I'm sharing with you. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what will you have me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and it will be told you what you must do. In Acts chapter 9, verses 8 and 9, we are told that Paul is blinded for three days. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and he neither did eat nor drink. Now, we're being told what literally happened to Paul as he was attempting to go to Damascus. But there's a biblical principle that history is prophecy. So this historical act that we have recorded is a prophetic illusion of things to come. Therefore, Paul being blinded for three days is a prophecy that from the days of Yeshua that the corporate Jewish nation would be blinded to believing that Yeshua is the Messiah and they would not receive their sight, realize that Yeshua is Messiah, until the third day. That third day prophetically is the Messianic era. Let's look how the three days here point to the Messianic era in the time of the end gathering of the exiles when the Jewish people corporately will believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. The Sabbath is the seventh day of creation. Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. The Sabbath is the seventh day, as we can see in Exodus chapter 20, verses 9 and 10. Six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. And in it you shall not do any work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger that is within your gates. This seventh day Sabbath is referred to in the Bible as the day of the Lord. Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and called the Sabbath of delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable. Biblical history is prophecy. So each day in creation represents 1,000 years of time. We are shown this principle in Psalm chapter 90, verse 4, as it is written. 
For a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. A day is likened unto a thousand years. This is repeated in the Brit Hadashah in the Renewed Covenant in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8, as it is written. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. It continues... And in Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 10, in reminding us of the principle that one day is a thousand years, it then says in Second Peter chapter 3 verse 10, but the day of the Lord. One day is with the Lord a thousand years and a thousand years is one day, but the day of the Lord. So how long is the day of the Lord? It is a thousand years. So how do we know when the day of the Lord is upon us? Because it says it will come as a thief in the night. The thief in the night is unexpectedly. We otherwise refer to it as tribulation. In which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth and all the works that are in thereof shall be burned up. That means the works and everything therein shall be burned up. That means that those things that are not being done to glorify the kingdom of Yahweh is going to be destroyed. Only those who are working for his kingdom, it's those works that will remain forever and ever. This seventh day Sabbath, which is known as the day of the Lord, is also a reference to the Messianic era, and the darkness part of the Messianic era is the tribulation period. We can see this from Isaiah chapter 13, verses 6 and 8, as it is written. How ye... For the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as destruction for the Almighty. So the day of the Lord comes as destruction. It's inaugurated by destruction. That's tribulation. And they shall be afraid. Pains and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travails. So the day of the Lord begins with tribulation. Zephaniah chapter 1 verses 14 and 15. The great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hastens greatly, even the voice of the day of the Lord. The mighty man shall cry there bitterly. That day, that is the day of the Lord. It's a day of wrath, a day of trouble, of distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness. The day of the Lord is also referred to by the term or the title as Jacob's Trouble. We find this in Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 6 and 7. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail, and all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great. What day? The day of the Lord. That day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. It is during Jacob's trouble that there will be the end of the exile of Jacob. Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 3 and 7, it is written, For lo, the days come, says the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to the fathers, and they will possess it. So the subject is Israel and Judah returning to their land. In describing the return to the land, it says in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, the day that they return to their land. It's great. None is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he will be saved out of it. When the exiles of Israel return back to the land of Israel, they are described as being blind. In Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 7 and 8, it is written, For thus says the Lord, Sing with gladness for Jacob, and shout among the chief of the nations. Publish ye, praise ye, and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Behold, I will bring them from the north country, and gather them from the coast of the earth, and with them the blind and the lame, the woman with child and her that travails with child together, a great company shall return thither. So, We have, in a period of time known as the Day of the Lord, which is the seventh day from the creation of Adam and Eve, but it's the third day from the first coming of Yeshua, that in the tribulation part of the Day of the Lord, which is also the beginning of the Messianic era, that we have the ingathering of the exiles. And the exiles who are gathered are regarded as being blind. 
And we see that Paul was blinded for three days. Israel is healed in the third day. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach, and by our gathering together unto him. Our gathering together unto him is the exiles being gathered back to the land of Israel. They're being gathered unto him. He then will be king over them that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Messiah is at hand. The in gathering of the exiles is called the day of Messiah because it's in that day he's going to set up his kingdom and rule and reign from Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 says that this day is also called the third day. Come and let us return to the Lord. He is torn, he will heal us. He is smitten, he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us, awaken us from our spiritual slumber. But in the third day, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. That is being gathered back to the land of Israel and live with him. And we do so once he sets his feet down on the Mount of Olives. So this is the prophetic allusion to why Paul was blinded for three days. It's a foreshadowing of the blindness until that third day when the blindness has got to be removed, which is the day of the end gathering of the exiles. What happens in Acts chapter 9 is Ananias has got to come and lay his hands upon Paul, and that's how he's got to receive his sight. But who is Ananias? And Paul testifying of what happened to him In Acts chapter 22, verses 11 and 12, he tells us that Ananias is a proselyte, as it is written. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus, and one, Ananias, and here is how he's described, a devout man according to the Torah, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there. What does it mean, a devout man, according to the Torah? In the book, The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner, on page 479, he says, proselytes followed the Torah. In the Tanaitic period, there was a large number of semi-proselytes or half-proselytes. These persons were called variously devout ones, fearers, God-fearers, worshippers of God, and the like. They are mentioned a number of times in the book of Acts of the Apostles and also in the works of Josephus. These God-fearers appropriated only the loftier ideas of Judaism, such as monotheism and the ethics of the prophets. Most of them kept the Sabbath and refrained from eating swine's flesh, but they did not observe the numerous ritual rules of Pharisaic Judaism. You know what we call these people today? Hebrew roots. Hebrew roots people. We want to follow Torah, but we're not following the numerous ritual rules of Pharisaic or Rabbinic Judaism. So in biblical times, they're called God-fearers, devout ones. Today, they are called Hebrew roots. This is who Ananias is. Yeshua instructs Ananias to go and see Paul. Acts chapter 9, verses 10 through 12, it is written. There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is praying and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Ananias is aware that Paul is a persecutor of believers in Yeshua. Therefore, in Acts chapter 9, verses 13 and 14, Ananias responds this way, as it is written. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on your name. Paul... Yeshua explains to Ananias is a chosen vessel of his. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. But the Lord said to him, Go your way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. The fact that he's a chosen vessel is an allusion to the task and the role of the nation of Israel, who is also chosen 
of the God of Israel. In Acts chapter 9, verse 15, where it says he's chosen, it is the Strong's number 1589 in the Greek dictionary, and it means a person chosen or God's elect. This is a term for the nation of Israel in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 4 as it is written. For Jacob, my servant's sake, in Israel, mine elect. This is the Strong's number 972 in the Hebrew dictionary. It is the Hebrew word beher, and it means chosen or elect of God. For Jacob, my servant's sake, in Israel, mine elect, I have even called you by your name, I have surnamed you, though you have not known me. We can also see from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, that the nation of Israel is chosen by the God of Israel. For you are a holy people unto the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Paul is then told that he will suffer greatly for Yeshua's sake. And what he's suffering for is the reason why Yeshua died on the tree, which is to proclaim the message that Yeshua is the Messiah, the forgiveness of sins and following Torah, and that he's the one that gathers the exiles of Israel. Acts chapter 9, verse 16, it is written, For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul is going to explain in Acts 28 that he's suffering for the hope of Israel. But what is the hope of Israel? Paul understands from the Hebrew Scriptures that his task in believing in Yeshua, as Yeshua is instructing him, is he's going to be sent out to the exiles of Israel, specifically with emphasis on Ephraim or the northern kingdom. Paul testifies to this in Acts chapter 13, verses 44 and 46 and 47, as it is written. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, Lo, we turn to the Gentiles. We're going to see the context of these Gentiles is the assimilated ten tribes who are scattered into the nations. We know this by what Paul quoted in making this proclamation from Acts chapter 13, verse 6. 47. For so has the Lord commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation unto the ends of the earth. Here, Paul is quoting from Isaiah in chapter 49. In verses 5 and 6, the subject is the ingathering of the exiles. In the book by Moses Nachmanides, or the Ramban, the book entitled The Book of Redemption on page 25 and 26, regarding Isaiah 49, verses 5 and 6, he comments, And now thus says the Lord that formed me from the womb to be his servant. It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the offspring of Israel. This alludes to his prophecies in general in which the prophet spoke concerning all of them. That is, the ten tribes lost in the Assyrian exile and the two tribes in the Babylonian exile. So this is talking about all twelve tribes. In Isaiah 49.9, it goes on to say that you may say to the prisoners, go forth. To them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways and their pastures shall be in all high places. Who are these prisoners? The rabbinical commentary is that they are the exiles of Israel. In the book, A Matter of Return, by Raphael Eisenberg on page 132, it comments regarding this verse. Prophesying about the future return of the exiles to their land, Isaiah states that you may say to the prisoners, go forth. To them that are in darkness, show yourselves. The Midrash Rabbah explains that the prisoners denotes the ten tribes residing beyond the Sabbatian River. This is where Jewish tradition has that they went. In the Sanchino Midrash Rabbah, volume 7, page 172, in commenting about Isaiah 49.9, it says this, saying to the prisoners, go forth. This alludes to those who were exiled to this side of the river Sabbatian. And this is an allusion to the exile of the ten tribes who were taken captive by the Assyrians. 
Ezekiel chapter 37 is a chapter that describes the exiles of Israel in the context of dry bones. In Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 1 through 3, it is written, The hand of the Lord was upon me, and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones. And he caused me to pass by them round about, and behold, they were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know. Continuing in Ezekiel chapter 37, verses 4 and 5, and verse 11, it is written, Again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, and say, O you dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus is the Lord God unto these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Then he said unto me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. That's all twelve tribes. Behold, they say, Our bones are dry, and our hope is is lost we are cut off from our parts as long as northern kingdom and southern kingdom are separated their hope is lost because their hope is to be reunited and to have the end of the exile which is associated with the task of king messiah to gather them and the messianic era the messianic era and messiah gathering the exiles of israel is the hope of Israel. So Paul explains that he's a prisoner of hope, and this is why he's suffering for Messiah's sake. In Acts chapter 28, verse 17, it is written, And it came to pass that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together, and when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. In Acts chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, it is written, But when the Jews spake against it, I was constrained to appeal to Caesar, not that I had ought to accuse my nation of. For this cause, therefore, have I called for you to see you and to speak with you, because for the hope of Israel I am bound with this chain. Yeshua told Paul that he will suffer great things for his namesake. Paul says, it's for the hope of Israel that I'm bound in this chain. Ananias then lays hands on Paul, and that is how Paul receives his sight. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Paul, the Lord, even Yeshua, that appeared unto you in the way as you came, has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit, or the Ruach HaKodesh. When Ananias is laying his hands upon Paul, it's a prophetic allusion to the laying on of hands and the blessing that was bestowed to Ephraim and Manasseh in Genesis chapter 48. So prophetically, this is an illusion that Ananias, who represents today a Hebrew roots person, is laying on his hands or imparting the knowledge or the understanding of the two houses and the ingathering the exiles and the role of Yeshua to accomplish that to Paul, who represents the corporate nation of Israel or the Jewish people represented by rabbinic Judaism who is blinded that Yeshua is the Messiah and he gathers the exiles of Israel. In Genesis chapter 48, verse 14 and verse 19, it is written, And Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly. For Manasseh was the firstborn. His younger brother shall be greater than he, that is Ephraim, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. In commenting, to this verse that Ephraim will be a multitude of nations in the Art Scroll of Genesis, volume 2, page 2,121. It says, Eben Ezra comments, many nations will descend from him. The word mellow or fullness connotes abundance, the phrase meaning, and his seed shall become the abundance of the nations. Rabbi Avraham, son of Harambam, Somewhat similarly says, the expression denotes abundant profligacy to a point that they will have to inhabit lands of other nations. It's an allusion to Ephraim's 
expanse of territory. Radar comments, this refers to the exile when the lands of others will be filled with his scattered descendants. It's a reference to Ephraim being blessed and being scattered into all the nations. Paul then is filled with the Holy Spirit or the Ruach HaKodesh. Acts chapter 9 verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Yeshua that appeared unto you in the way as you came has sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. The reason why Paul in receiving his sight is filled with the Holy Spirit is so that he could be empowered to proclaim Messiah, repentance of sins, and the ingathering of the exiles. That is the purpose of the empowering of the Ruach as is stated in Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You will receive power after the Ruach HaKodesh has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. That is the witness of the restoration of the kingdom to Israel or the ingathering of the exiles in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. Paul taught the ingathering of the exiles as he testified in Acts chapter 26, verses 6 and 7. And now I stand in and judge for the hope of the promise made of God unto our fathers. What is this promise? Under which promise our twelve tribes instantly serving God day and night hope to come. Hope to come is future. Their hope is that they would be united and gathered from all the nations where they've been scattered by the Messiah. Paul then preached Yeshua in the synagogues. Acts chapter 9, verses 19 and 20. And when he had received meat, which is an allusion to a deeper understanding of the Torah, that Yeshua is the Messiah and his role to gather the exiles of Israel, he was strengthened. He understood. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Messiah in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. What's the summary of how Paul's conversion is related to the two houses in the ingathering of the exiles? Paul, who was playing the prophetic role of rabbinic Judaism, was blinded for three days. Paul being blind for three days prophetically represents rabbinic Judaism not accepting Yeshua as Messiah until the Messianic era. Ananias, who is described as being a non-Jew who followed biblical Torah, was instructed by Yeshua to lay hands on Paul to receive his sight. Ananias laying his hands on Paul prophetically represents that in the end of days that non-Jews who follow Torah will impart the knowledge of the role of Yeshua to gather the exiles of Israel to Rabbinic Judaism. Believers in Yeshua as the Messiah from Rabbinic Judaism in the end of days will proclaim Yeshua as the Messiah in the ingathering of the exiles to their fellow Jews. Next, let's look at Acts in chapter 10 and Peter's vision. Acts chapter 10 verse 1, we're told that Cornelius is a proselyte. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. And in describing him, it says he's a devout man and one that feared God with all his house. Once again, these words describe that he's a follower of Torah, but he doesn't follow all the oral law. In the book, The Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner on page 479, he describes that people referred to as devout ones, fearers, God-fearers, worshipers of God are mentioned in the book of Acts and also in the works of Josephus. These God-fearers appropriated only the loftier ideas of Judaism such as monotheism and the ethics of the prophets. Most of them kept the Sabbath and refrained from eating swine's flesh that is, they followed biblical Torah, but they did not observe the numerous ritual rules of Pharisaic Judaism. Or in other words, they didn't follow all of the oral law. In Acts chapter 10, verse 3 and verses 5 and 6, we are told that Cornelius is instructed by an angel to send men to Peter. He saw in a vision, evidently about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell you what you ought 
to do. Cornelius then sends three people to see Peter. Acts chapter 10, verse 7 and 8. And when the angel which spake unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. And when he had declared all these things unto them, he sent them to Joppa. Peter then has a vision while he is praying. Acts chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. On the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry, and he would have eaten, but while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Acts chapter 10, verse 11, it tells us that Peter sees a talit in his vision. And he saw heaven open and a certain vessel descending upon him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners. What is the great sheet knit at the four corners that's let down to the earth? It's a talit. He's being shown a talit. Why is he being shown a talit? What does the talit represent? The talit represents following the commandments. And by following the commandments, which ultimately means believing that Yeshua is the Messiah because he's the living Torah who gave the commandments, that the exiles of Israel would be healed from their sins. Also, a traditional biblical wedding takes place underneath a hoopah, which is represented by a tallit with four poles today. In Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 20. We are told about a woman who has an issue of blood. She reaches out and touches the hem of Yeshua's garment, which is the talit, and she becomes healed. And a certain woman which had an issue of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Yeshua, she came in the press behind and touched his garment. And what's at the corner of Yeshua's garment is zitzit. In Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 through 40, we are told the purpose of wearing zitzit on the corner of your garment. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make fringes in the border of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them, that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which you used to go whoring, that you remember to do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. So the zitzit, which is on the corner of a talit, is there to remind you to keep the commandments. When the woman with the issue of blood touched Yeshua's Zitzit, she was healed of her plague. In Mark chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, it is written, For she said, If I might touch his clothes, which represents following Torah, I will be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. The plague being the punishment of exile into the nation's which was caused by breaking the commandments, which means not following Torah. In Acts chapter 10, verse 12, Peter sees unclean animals in his vision, wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. What we're now going to see is these unclean animals, which Peter sees in his vision, is how the exiles of Israel, specifically the northern kingdom, are described. So these unclean animals represent the northern kingdom or Ephraim scattered in the nations. Let's first see how these entities are unclean according to the Torah. It is forbidden by Torah to eat unclean food. Leviticus chapter 11 verse 7, it says regarding swine, And the swine, though he divide the hoof and be cloven-footed, yet he choose not the cud, he is unclean to you. In Leviticus chapter 11 verses 41 and 42, we're told that 
Various animals that creep on the earth are unclean. And every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth shall be an abomination that shall not be eaten. Whatsoever goes upon the belly, and one of the things that goes upon a belly is a snake. And whatsoever goes upon all four or whatsoever has more feet among all the creeping things that creep upon the earth, them you shall not eat, for they are an abomination. In Leviticus chapter 11, verses 13 and 14, we're told that there are certain fowls that are unclean. And these are they which ye shall have in abomination among the fowls, in the vulture. So vultures are unclean birds. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 25, it is written, You shall therefore put difference between clean beef and unclean, and between unclean fowls and clean. And you shall not make your souls abominable by beasts, or by fowl, or by any manner of living things that creeps on the ground. These are the three things that Peter saw in his vision, which I have separated from you as unclean. In order to understand how this is related to the northern kingdom and their exile, we need to understand what happened to the northern kingdom. They were taken captive by the Assyrians. In 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 29, it is written, In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, came Tiklat Pileser, king of Assyria, and he took various cities that are mentioned here, which includes Gilead and Galilee and all the land of Naphtali, and he carried them captive to Assyria. In Hosea chapter 9, verse 3, we're told that when the northern kingdom, or Ephraim, was taken captive by the Assyrians, that they ate unclean things. Hosea chapter 9, verse 3, it is written, They shall not dwell in the Lord's land, but Ephraim shall return to Egypt, and they will eat unclean things in Assyria. Do you remember when you went to grade school? They would used to say, you are what you eat. So you eat unclean things, that makes you unclean. If you eat an unclean fowl, then you are an unclean fowl, or likened unto one. So that is how these unclean animals is likened unto the northern kingdom. But we'll see it even clearer as we continue. The book of Hosea is written as a judgment against the northern kingdom and also speaks of their restoration. In Hosea chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, we're told that Hosea is to marry a whore by the name of Gomer, as it is written. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto you a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms, for the land is committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. There are three children that are mentioned in Hosea 1 that are born from this marriage. The first child mentioned in the chapter is Jezreel. Jezreel means God will sow or God will scatter. And so he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblaim, which conceived and bare him a son. And the Lord said, call his name Jezreel, which means God will sow or God will scatter. So the God of Israel has got to sow or scatter the northern kingdom into the nations of the world. In the Torah Anthology to the Book of the Twelve Prophets, Volume 1, page 15, in commenting about this prophecy it says in the targum jezreel is translated as scattered call his name jezreel thus means that hosea prophesied the future exile of the ten tribes they would be scattered among the nations the second child mentioned in hosea chapter 1 verse 6 is lo ruhama or no mercy and she conceived again and bare a daughter, and God said unto him, Call her name Lo-Ruhamah. Lo in Hebrew is not, Ruhamah is mercy. For I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. The third child mentioned is Lo-Ami, or not my people. Lo in Hebrew is not, Am is people, Ami is my people. Hosea chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Now when she had weaned Lo-Ruhamah, she conceived and bare a son. Then said God, call his name Lo-Ami, for you are not my people, and I will not be your God. In the Torah Anthology to the Book of the Twelve Prophets, Volume 1, page 18, 
The commentary is that Ephraim would be assimilated among the nations. According to the Targum, says Rashi, this means that the entire generation would be obliterated by merging into the nations among whom they are banished. In Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, it begins to speak about the restoration of the northern kingdom following their punishment. Even though the God of Israel declared that he would not have mercy and they would not be his people, he ultimately would show mercy upon them. Hosea chapter 1, verse 10, it is written, Yet, even though no mercy not my people, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. These are the words that was promised to Abraham. Therefore, through this judgment, the God of Israel will fulfill his covenant promise to Abraham. And it will come to pass that in the place where it was said, you are not my people, where was it said you are not my people? Right here in the prophesied judgment to the northern kingdom that is mentioned here in the book of Hosea. That it will be said, you are the sons of the living God. Who is the son of the living God? It is a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, as we can see in John chapter 1, verse 12, as is written. But as many as received him, that is, Yeshua, to them gave he power to be called the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. In Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 6 and verses 8 and 9, Israel's abominations are associated with creeping things and abominable beasts. He said further unto me, Son of man, see thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary? But turn you yet again, and you will see greater abominations. And he said to me, Go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping thing and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. So the idolatry of the house of Israel is personified by abominable beasts and creeping things. This is what Peter saw in his vision. In Hosea chapter 2, in prophesying about the restoration of the northern kingdom after their punishment into all the nations of the world, it tells us that the God of Israel is going to make a covenant with them. And in speaking about this covenant he's got to make with them, he says these words to them about this covenant he's making in Hosea chapter 2 and verse 18. And in that day I will make a covenant. He's speaking to the northern kingdom. In that day I will make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground. He's calling the northern kingdom who he's making the covenant with, he's calling them a beast of the field, a fowl, and a creeping thing, because they were unclean in their abominations. And I will betroth you unto me forever. He's entering into marriage, a marriage covenant of restoration with the northern kingdom, who's described as a beast of the field, a fowl of the heaven, and a creeping thing. I will betroth you unto me forever. I will betroth you unto me in righteousness, and in judgment, and in loving kindness, and in mercies. And I will betroth you unto me in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. Prior to this promise that he would make a covenant with the northern kingdom, even though they've committed adultery against him, what precedes that in the text in Hosea 2 is the prophecy of the ingathering of the exiles. In commenting about that in the Messianic Idea in Israel by Joseph Klausner on page 48, it says, in Hosea he prophesies that the future redemption will be like the redemption from the Egyptian bondage. Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly unto her, and I will give her her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor. Achor means trouble or troubling, the valley of trouble or the tribulation will be a door of hope. And she will respond there as in the days of her youth, as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. So in talking about the regathering from all the lands where they've been scattered, then he says in the next verse, or in the verses following, that I'm going to make a covenant with the fowls of the air, the beasts of the field, the creeping things, and I will betroth you unto me forever. So this covenant with the creeping things and the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field is linked with the ingathering of the exiles. Peter is then told in Acts chapter 10 verse 13 to slay and eat. There came a voice to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. The word kill 
here, it's the Strong's number 2380 in the Greek dictionary. It means to sacrifice or to slaughter. So he's being told to sacrifice or to slaughter and to eat. Taking this back to the Torah and the understanding of slaying and sacrificing, in Genesis chapter 31, verse 54, it is written, Then Jacob offered sacrifice. The word sacrifice is the Strong's number 2077. It's the Hebrew word zabak, which means a sacrifice, a covenant sacrifice, or a thank offering. Look what happens when Jacob makes this sacrifice, which he has to kill an animal to do this. He offered sacrifice upon the mount and called his brethren to eat bread. He's killing and eating. And they did eat bread and tarried all night in the mount. And... In the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they, in being hospitable to their guests, they invited them into the tent to have the meal. The tent personifies a hoopah or this talit that Peter is seeing in his vision. He said to Peter, kill and eat. So he saw a talit and he's to eat. So when you have a marriage today under a hoopah, which is personified by a tallit and four poles. It's under the tallit or the hoopah where you have your vows, and a vow is a time of having fellowship at that table and the exchanging of vows. So what's being personified here is half table fellowship with your brethren, the northern kingdom. Sacrifices are done to draw near to the God of Israel. Leviticus chapter 3, verse 1. And if his oblation be a sacrifice. The word oblation is the Strong's number 7133. It's the Hebrew word korban, which is connected to the Hebrew root word kerav, which means to come near or approach. Whenever you're offering a korban to the God of Israel, it's for the purpose of drawing near to him. So if your korban, your oblation be a sacrifice a zavak. So a zavak, or the killing, is for the purpose of drawing near to the God of Israel. So this sacrifice, or this korban that Peter is told to kill, it's for the purpose of eating or to have friendship, to be in table fellowship with, ultimately, the non-Jewish world that believes that Yeshua is the Messiah. Leviticus chapter 3, verse 1. And if your korban, your oblation, be a zavak, a sacrifice, if it be of a peace offering. This is the Strong's number 8002, which is shalem. And shalem is a peace offering, or it's specifically a sacrifice for friendship. If you're going to kill, to draw near to me, and the offering that you're offering is a friendship offering which has the purpose of drawing near to me. That is what Peter's told to do by the words kill and eat, taking it back to the Torah foundation of the meaning of the words. A sacrifice or a korban for friendship is an offering to Yahweh. Leviticus chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. If his oblation, a korban, be a sacrifice, a zavak, of a peace offering, shalem, This is what you do if you're doing that. You shall lay your hand upon the head of his offering and kill it, and you will offer the sacrifice of the peace offering as an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. This is what Peter is asked to do. Peter is told three times to eat. Acts chapter 10, verses 14 through 16. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spake unto him again the second time, What God has cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done three times, and the vessel was received up again into heaven. The three times represent three men. Acts chapter 10, verse 17 and verses 19 and 20. Now, while Peter doubted in himself what this vision which he had seen should mean, because he didn't understand that the God of Israel was communicating to him to make a korban to draw near in a shalem offering and have table fellowship with non-Jews who believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, he was at the moment looking at it through literal eyes, thinking 
that I'm being told that I'm supposed to eat unclean? No, the Torah forbids me from doing this. So that's why he doubted. But while he was doubting and wondering what it meant, Acts chapter 10, verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said, Behold, three men seek you. This was said three times, three men seek you. Now he's got to put two and two together. The three times meant the three men who was coming to see him. Arise, therefore, and get you down and go with them, doubting nothing. Doubting what? Doubting to receive the three men. The vision was just the vehicle to not doubt fellowship with the three men. It was not telling Peter to eat unclean foods, as the church traditionally teaches. Peter's attitude toward the non-Jew, which was the purpose why Yeshua had to give the vision to Peter, represents the attitude of rabbinic Judaism toward the non-Jew. Peter's got to represent the rabbinic Jew. Then Peter went down to the men which were sent unto him from Cornelius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing, a violation of Torah. Or specifically, this would be a violation of rabbinic oral law. Not written law, rabbinic oral law. For a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation. That is to eat with someone who is not a rabbinic Jew. But why is that not to be done according to rabbinic Judaism or oral law teaching? Well, let's look at what the Torah has to say about food and see why this teaching exists. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 10, it is written, And whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel or of the stranger that sojourns among you, that eats any manner of blood, I will even set my face against that soul that eats blood and will cut him off from among his people. So the Torah says that there's a proper way to eat. In Pirkei Avot 1.1, which is the sayings of the fathers, there is a mandate to make a fence around the Torah. Pirkei Avot 1.1 begins this way. Moses received the Torah from Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua. Joshua transmitted it to the elders, the elders to the prophets, and the prophets transmitted it to the men of the great assembly. They, that is the men of the great assembly, said three things. Be deliberate in judgment, raise many students, and make a protective fence around the Torah. So rabbinic Judaism puts what's called a fence around the Torah, a protection so you won't violate the commandment, which is what? That you're to not eat blood. So how do we understand this fence? The rabbinic fence for Jews is their policy of not associating with non-Jews. In the Talmud, in Ovedah Zarah 37 to 43, and commenting on this part of the Talmud in the weekly dove put out by Orsa Mayak and Rabbi Mendel Weinbach, he comments, the conclusion of the Gemara is that the prohibition against food cooked by non-Jews is of rabbinic origin, either to discourage intimacy and dining with non-Jews, which may lead to eating their non-kosher food, which is the explanation of Rashi, or to discourage the social contact, which may lead to intermarriage. And this is Tosafot. Then, in Acts chapter 10, verse 28, Peter is told to not call any man unclean. And he said unto them, You know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come into one of another nation. But, see that's the oral law teaching in building a fence around the Torah. But, God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. The purpose of the vision is God is instructing Peter not to call any man common or unclean. What's the understanding of not call any man common or unclean? Man is a reference to the exiles of Israel. Matthew chapter 4 verse 19, the exiles of Israel, referring back to Ezekiel in chapter 34 verse 31, are called men or Adam. He said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. In the art scroll of Ezekiel on page 30, we have this commentary. From Ezekiel 34, verse 31. You, Israel, are Adam, or men. And the family of Israel in its entirety is called Adam, or men. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 10. So don't call any man. That is 
the nation of Israel, specifically the northern kingdom. Don't call them unclean if they've accepted Yeshua as the Messiah, they've repented of their sins, and they are returning to the covenant. Let's look at a summary of Acts chapter 10 in Peter's vision of what we can learn from this account. Yeshua was instructing Peter, who was playing the prophetic role of rabbinic Jewish mindset and thought, to accept and have table fellowship with non-Jewish Ephraimites who believe that Yeshua is the Messiah and that this should be done as a way of drawing near or korban to the God of Israel by presenting to him a peace offering that is friendship between Ephraim and Judah. This is the prophetic meaning of what the God of Israel was communicating to Peter and how it relates to the two houses and the ingathering of the exiles in their reunification under Yeshua the Messiah. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 7, we're told that Peter is an apostle to Judah. Judah is referred to here as circumcision. When they saw that the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. So Peter was given the role or the task to proclaim Yeshua as the Messiah to the Jews. He was given the gospel of the circumcision. Here, Jews are referred to as the circumcision. Why are they referred to as the circumcision? Because in order to be a part of the covenant in Genesis chapter 17, the God of Israel instructed Abraham that they were to circumcise their children, and when you circumcise your children, you cut the covenant, and you're a part of the covenant. So circumcision means to be a part of the covenant. So the Jews are called the circumcision. Paul is an apostle to Ephraim. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, it is written, And when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, that is Paul, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, that is the Jews, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles or the uncircumcision. Uncircumcision means you are cut off from the covenant. Well, who was cut off from the covenant? The northern kingdom in Hosea 1, because the God of Israel declared unto them, No mercy, not my people. They were cut off from the covenant. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 8 says that they were divorced. So their status is uncircumcision. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 18 and 19, we are told that whether you are Judah or whether you are Ephraim, that's not the issue. The issue is following Torah and keeping the commandments of Yeshua HaMashiach. Is any man called being circumcised? This is a term for Judah or from Judah or being Jewish. Let him not become uncircumcised. Let him not forsake his Jewishness, his Jewish ways in following Torah. Let him not become uncircumcised or try to be like Ephraim. Is any man called in uncircumcision? Is any man from Ephraim? Or would be identified biblically as being a part of the house of Israel, Ephraim, or the northern kingdom, or the ten tribes? And that would include being grafted in through the redemptive work of Yeshua the Messiah. Let him not be circumcised. Don't try to be a rabbinic Jew. Why? Because the issue isn't whether you're Jewish or non-Jewish. Circumcision is nothing. It's not that you're Jewish and uncircumcision is nothing. It's not that you are not Jewish or you're Ephraim. It's not the issue of whether you're Jew or Ephraim. But the issue is keeping the commandments of God. That is following Torah. We can see from these teachings then that Yeshua's ministry is centered on gathering the exiles of Israel and he sent out fishers to gather the exiles of Israel and that is the context of understanding Acts chapter 9, the conversion of Paul and Peter's vision. It was for this purpose of calling them out and to the exile scattered the nations and declare Yeshua is the Messiah, repenting of sins, and he's going to gather the exiles of Israel and how you're supposed to relate to each other when that is done. That is why we are told 
in 1 John in chapter 2 and verse 6. He who says he abides in him, he who says that he is a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, ought himself to walk even as he walked. And how did Yeshua walk? He kept the Torah or the commandments of his Father. Even as he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. In John chapter 14, verse 15. Shalom in Yeshua the Messiah. Amen.